to the top of the pound sign. You will now. Okay, Krista Lee. Today is entitled A Composite Study of Snow Squall Environments Across Northern New York and Vermont. My name is Peter Benakis. I'm a lead forecaster here at the Weather Service Forecast Office in Burlington, Vermont. This is research done with a co-worker of mine, Andrew Lacanto, and also Greg DeVore, who is at the WO State College. Here we have today's talk. We'll start with some background information on snow squalls and their societal impacts. We'll look at synoptic and mesoscale snow squall environments. We'll look at the squall composite parameter that we created and how we transition that from research into operations. And we'll conclude talking about National Weather Service products and external partnerships when it comes to forecasting snow squalls. short-lived bursts of heavy snow, which are often accompanied by a sudden increase in surface wind speed as well as decreasing temperature. Their importance is that they have a disproportionately large impact on transportation, both for drivers and airport operations, relative to the smooth snow that's generally produced with squalls. They're intensity sub-advisory events and that they don't typically reach snow advisory criteria, which for our forecast areas, four inches of snow in 12 hours, will have significant impacts, including a very low visibility, flash freeze situations as temperatures drop behind the squall, dry and confusion. So in context today, we'll be talking about squalls not associated with lake effect snow, but that are associated with either cold fronts or mobile upper level troughs. Unfortunately, history of deadly accidents with all events where you have one inch of snow or less accumulation. All of the events shown here, these newspaper headlines and so forth, are from this past cool season. And unfortunately, we have had many accidents and pileups and things of that nature on interstate highways and so forth. And forecasters, our main goal is trying to figure out how we can mitigate this. We've done studies done on snow squalls, again, unlike effect snow squalls, we see a gap in, in the composite studies. There hasn't been much done in that area. There's been several case studies done recently. There's a forecast technique known as the Windex technique that came out in the early 1990s that was used regionally across New York and New England. But it was based on the textural FUS output from the numerical models and is a little bit antiquated at this point. And there's also work done by Greg DeVore's College on enhancing weather service partnerships with the Department of Transportation in, in Pennsylvania. It was to expand, especially on the composite study, since that's not really been done before, by creating a snow squall database to move our meteorological understanding through compositing. We then forecast our situational awareness by developing a new snow squall parameter, while keeping in mind that these are generally low QPF events that don't typically catch the eye forecast. We want to continue to improve operational messaging and enhance those state and local partnerships and bait our snow squall parameter that we'll talk about later against individual uh, cases. There should be more certainty in forecast products, better lead times, and better external communication. And the hope would be that road crews would pre treat surfaces, which has been shown will help mitigate a lot of the more significant impacts that occur on the roadways. Going with this talk, as far as developing the snow squall database, we took sites in our forecast area, Messina, New York, Berlin, and Montpelier, Vermont, and we systematically searched through 10 years of surface data at three sites looking for a current of moderate or heavy snow, visibility of a half mile or less, and a really wind component to filter out the typical nor'easter, northeast wind type events where we get a lot of our moderate and heavy snow to make the database a little bit more manageable um, by looking for a westerly component of the wind in moderate to heavy snow. 
Now, each one of these observations was then compared with two kilometer composite radar reflectivity to subject, subjectively determine if the event was indeed associated with a cold front or mobile upper level trough and not a stratiform or warm convection type of event. In the 36 total snow squall events, running winter of 2001, 2002 through 2010, 2011, six hybrid events where there was a pre existing lake streamer which also interacted with a cold front. And then we logged surface data characteristics for each of the cases. To look at what the snow squall events look like, you're more of a low top convective line. In that context, it's useful to think of these squalls as a mesoscale convective system. So a standard case shown on the left, we have a narrow convective line. A case is one where again we have a pre-existing lake streamer, in this case extending off of Lake Ontario. And you can see on the eastern end it's being entrained into uh, what was a mobile upper level trough moving across northern New York at this time. Now I should that the end result for our forecast area is generally the same. You generally have a brief burst of moderate to heavy snow, um, whether it's a standard case or a hybrid. Climatology now looking at some surface weather characteristics, some North American reanalysis data composites, and then we'll look at some data in buff kit to examine time height cross sections. First is the diurnal distribution of these events. They tend to be more common during the daylight hours, about two and a half times more common for our sample of 36 cases. We have those between 13 and 23Z, and only 11 cases between about 1 and 9Z during the overnight hours. The winter time and low sun angle are con based on convective events, and you're a bit more likely to have small amounts of surface based instability during the daylight hours than you are at night, which we believe is one reason for this distribution looking the way it does. Monthly distribution, we found the events are more or less evenly distributed across the winter season with a peak in February of 10 cases. of the individual events. These are box and whisker plots showing the length of time the heavy snow and moderate snow lasted. Uh, so consistent with our subjective experience, the heavy snow typically lasts 17 minutes for the median, and the box portion represents the interquartile range, or the middle 50% of the data set, with heavy snow between 14 and 24 minutes in length. And moderate snow at the ASOS sites, the median length of time was 26 minutes, and the interquartile range between 15 and 36 minutes. Dovetails with our subjective experience as we see snow squalls come through with, with frontal boundaries. A contract weather observer and able to gather some additional information for 21 events that affected Burlington, Vermont specifically. Amount associated with the squalls in one inch, and for the 12 hour period inclusive to the squall, 1.6 inches in the median. So it's to show that they are sub advisory events for our forecast area. Precipitation, if you mount the amount of snow produced, uh, you're only looking at about five hundredths of an inch. So again, not something that's typically going to grab the attention of forecasters on shift. Snow to liquid water ratios tend to be high in these cases, a median of 1 to 1 and sometimes upwards of 30 to 1. The quality of the flow west to northwest flow is that the precipitation tends to be on the dry side and uh, the liquid ratios um, are generally 20 to 1 or even greater. Look at some key synoptic features now. This is 300 millibars, and in the upper left, we see for the 36 cases, or in the mean, excuse me, a trough across southeastern Canada extending southward into New York and New England with a 200 decameter anomaly as compared to climatology. We see the 300 millibar heights and winds, and 
the evidence of split flow. We have a north branch jet extending from the Canadian prairies across the Great Lakes and then extending down off the mid-Atlantic coast uh, with a small jet core there just east to the Delmarva Peninsula. Some evidence perhaps of a subtropical jet extending from northwestern Mexico across the southeastern U.S. with confluent flow to the south of our region and in general cyclonic flow across northern New York and New England. Bars now. Some of the key features, again, cyclonic flow at this level. We're on the shear side of a 500 millibar jet, and it's interesting to note that that's true for all 36 cases that we have cyclonic shear side of the upper level jet. Now, what we're looking at in the animation is a six hour loop extending from three hours before the time of the squall. T naught would be the time closest to the squall, and T plus three hours would be three hours after the squall occurrence. And cyclonic flow aloft, cyclonic shear side of the upper level jet in all cases, there or just upstream of the mean trough axis. And not surprisingly, we see strong northwesterly flow again with cyclonic curvature, pretty much true at all levels in the troposphere. We have approaching baroclinic zone or cold front in the mean, as you can see the strong cold advection approaching from Ontario and Quebec across New York and England. And the strongest winds at 850 are just south of our forecast area. Scale now. We want to see what the buff kit program can tell us using time height cross sections about the snow squall environment, looking at a little bit more smaller scale detail. I just picked a representative case. This is from December 7th, 2008, using the 12Z NAM data. And we're looking at the height cross section where time, the earliest time is on the left, and later time is, excuse me, this time is on the right, and the later time flows to the left. Ours represents the QPF forecast, which in this case was only about five hundredths of an inch. And the line is there um, at about 20 to 21Z on this particular represent the upward vertical motion. Now, all the action is focused in the lowest two kilometers above gravel with a map in the upward vertical motion at about one kilometer. See relatively high levels of relative humidity shown in the, the green background color. I'm going to send the cold frontal position now and a few additional variables. First, we have the dendrite growth zone, which is that layer of the atmosphere from minus 12 to minus 18 C. Importantly, we see an intersection of the upward vertical motion with the dendritic growth zone. So this is, from a microphysical standpoint, this is optimal. You have excellent dendrite snow growth, and this is good heavy snow production. Let's see if we can go. Uh, we're now looking at the equivalent potential temperature of the E surfaces. At the front, you have a packing of the theta E surfaces and with uh, colder and drier air behind the front at later times, um, for zero Z in this case. I want your attention to the 280K centrope. In we have an area where theta E is decreasing with respect. In this case, we have, by definition, potential instability present just in advance of the front. So we have very focused upward vertical motion, and we all have this small area of low level potential instability at the cold front. Isentropes of this is actually just potential temperature, again, showing the vertical orientation where the lapse rates are steep associated with the front and also the packing of the isentropes as you would expect with any type of frontal boundary. Also, we would expect a ice attack wind max, so the magnitude of the wind is just below one kilometer and just rearward of the front of about 38 knots in this case. And with the steep lapse rates, you'd expect good downward momentum transfer, and that tends to produce the squally wind conditions um, as the front comes through. Cases are strongly forced. We have a strong cold front 
which is producing strong upward vertical motion in the lowest couple of kilometers. And this is, this is just one representative case, but this was a common theme in all the archive buff kit time height cross sections that we looked at. So surprise, you want to look for a brief but intense zone of omega, upward vertical motion, low, lowest two kilometers above ground level. This will intersect the dendritic growth zone and saturated H greater than 90% atmosphere. It's a J level cold frontal boundary. You see the E surfaces, vertical orientation, or even folded, where you actually have theta E decreasing with height. A well defined wind shift, of course, with the front and the strongest wind speeds mixing will be a lot just behind the front. And again, get hung up on the amount of precipitation. The model passing is likely going to be less than a tenth of an inch or so. What we were able to look at in buff kit, it gave us some ideas of very atmospheric parameters that we wanted to look at further using hourly North American reanalysis data using the GEMPAC software routine. A partial list of some of the things that we looked at, and our goal was to look for between cases and to perhaps creating four panel images to help forecasters and also for a creation of this snow squall parameter. So uh, the way we did this using box and whisker plots helps us to see the differences in the data set. So on the left hand side we have the zero to two kilometer mean wind speed. The and whiskers for the 36 snow squall cases. And then on the right, we have a control data set, which we took every three hourly time step in the NAR during the winter season 2005 2006, so 108 time steps. And we examine um, each of these variables independently. I'll show a few of them here um, during the cases. We see, as we might expect, a slightly higher amount of 0 to 2 kilometer wind speed the control case. So we're approaching 12 meters per second in the median, and on a full day it's about 8.4 meters per second. And two kilometer moisture measured in terms of the mean relative humidity. There's a lot of lap between these two data sets, but we do see a little bit more of a concentrated region um, uh, per space for the snow squall cases with about uh, 77%. Differences showed up was when we were looking at the instability parameters. Now on the left we have the surface-based CAPE. We do see in the median we have CAPE with these events, 36 joules per kilogram. So it's weakable. Today the median CAPE is zero. We tend not to have a lot of instability in the wintertime, of course. On the right side we see the surface to two kilometer theta E difference. And again, this goes back to the buff kit looking for that decreasing theta E with height. And in the median, we do see that we have a minus one degree Celsius change, typically between surface and two kilometers of the theta E. And see how well offset that is from the, uh, the sample, which typically have an increase of 9.5 in the median. So this is very helpful. This is something we can really try in on for focusing on the favorable environments for, for school walls. And scatter plots and other things and it helped us, for example, in this case looking at the meter the two kilometer or theta E along the Y axis and it favored spaces uh, between variables, again, was a way that we were able to focus in on uh, what would be favorable for the presence of snow squalls on the NAR data. Necessary ingredients for snow squalls, if you want to think about it in an ingredients-based context, these essentially mesoscale convective systems. So we have moist convective structures, but at the same time, it needs to be cold enough for snow. So, as with any type of moist convection, you want to sure lift and instability. On that, you need a certain threshold of wind, and you need a vertical temperature that's going to 
to be cold enough to support snow. So in terms of how would we formulate this, what factors would go into a, a dimensional parameter, which we will plainly for values that are greater than zero. A threshold we can use is to look at the surface wet bulb temperature and ensure that that is less than or equal to one degree Celsius at two meters. Vents, we don't have warm layers aloft. If there's going to be a problem in terms of temperature, it's usually within the boundary layer. So this is a, a quick and dirty way to ensure that it's, it's really cold enough near the surface that we're going to be dealing with snow and not liquid precipitation types. The water is composed of three factors. The moisture factor, based on the surface at 2 kilometer RH, low level stability, based on that surface to 2 kilometer theta E difference, and also a wind speed threshold on the right. No squall parameter itself will approach zero as any one of these individual variables approaches zero. So that's a favorable attribute. If ingredients are missing, then we don't want to have anything highlighted. In terms of lift, that would be assessed independently, and we'll show how to do that looking for rise fall couplets since these to be strongly forced events. Case using NAR data, but they ca it can be tweaked for operational models as necessary. And did our box and whisker uh, plot here on normalized values uh, between the 25th and 50th percentile to come with no squall parameter equation shown in the previous slide? So, with we'll this for our 36 snow squall events, we see the snow squall parameter in the median was about one. And our control case, the median was zero. So this is very good. We also did a time series for the entire winter. And I'm pleased with this as well. There's a good signal to noise ratio where we have we have positive values of snow squall parameter when the kinematic and thermodynamic environment is favorable. And that's interspersed with many more days in which there is a zero value for this variable. So we're pleased with as well. Formal probability of detection and false alarm ratio statistics uh, on the three hourly NAR for each of the ASOS locations. And we have a high POD, um, especially at low levels of snow squall parameter. As we ramp that up, then we're saying we're going to forecast the events less frequently because it's less frequent that you'll see that sort of threshold in the NAR data. Yeah. Alarm data comes from our. 2005-2006, and false alarm rates, as is typical with these types of parameters, uh, tends to run a little bit on the high side. It's between about 40 and 50 percent at values of snow squall parameter less than one. But we did check the sensitivity of this result against the visibility threshold of a half mile or less. We looked at IFR condition of less than three miles, and we see that that greatly reduced the false alarm rate, such that many these events are near misses in which we're getting convective snow showers, but we're not quite meeting that half mile threshold. So you see the the area in the dash gray line is a lot less if you're looking at just three mile or less visibility. Look at examples very quickly here. Uh, going back to uh, a case in 12th of February 2003 using the NAR data set. Let's look at two cases from this past winter where we took the snow squall parameter and implemented it into our uh, BTV 12 kilometer wharf model, the of January and the 20th of January. And the 12 kilometer wharf is initialized with the GFS with no convective parameterization scheme, so it's just dealing with convection explicitly within the model. case we're going to look at first from the 11th and 12th of February 2003 and it's some no duration and in, in we had severe wind gusts at many of the ASOS stations stretching from the Dakotas all the way over to Binghamton New York uh, the, the convective started actually up in the Canadian prairies at 6 the 11th uh, during the 11th you can see it's progressing through the Dakotas the upper Mississippi Bay, and then the southern Great Lakes area evening hours on the 11th and then during the overnight into the early morning hours on the 12th it's coming into the Ohio Valley and finally across Pennsylvania and into New York. 
we have the maximum uh, snow uh, rates observed at the ASOS sites, which range from one to three inches within that war period, essentially just with the snow squall as it came through. And considerable amount of cloud to ground lightning in this case, as is plotted in the insert in the lower right. All the meteorological details, we do want to how the snow squall parameter looked for this uh, particular case. It is on the map on the left, uh, show the values of snow squall parameter with the scale ranging from 0 to 5. We also have plotted in the black lines are the sea level pressure, and then we have surface isalabars. For a gradient, these rise fall couplets are useful to assess uh, where the strongest convergence is, which is on the leading edge of the strongest area of the pressure rises. And you see it lines up quite well with this front that's coming down. You can see the pressure trough, uh, 21Z across Iowa, the Z coming across Illinois, and then at 3Z across uh, lower Michigan and across Indiana. Now, there's other areas where the snow squall parameter happened to be positive, uh, fall across the UP of Michigan, where there was this lake effect snow that was occurring. Across West Virginia there, especially at 21Z, where likewise there was one to two miles in, in some snow activity. So where we focus, though, for the snow squalls themselves is where you have the strong dynamic forcing and have this pressure rise fall couplet and associate with the stronger values of the snow squall parameter it tends to be a really good place to look. And on the map, the coincident times uh, with radar reflectivity, and that lines up quite well. Uh, with perhaps a slight lag, probably due to the resolution of the NAR data more than anything else, but also recognizing that behind the front, a uh, brief period of time, you have your steep lapse rates, high levels of RH, and strong winds, especially in this case, that will tend, tend to side and uh, decrease as you head back further behind uh, these frontal boundaries. So that's for this particular case. Next slide. Now, what we do, once we satisfied with the parameter within the NAR data and did some testing, we implemented it operationally using our, our local wharf model. Love it from the 17th of January 2013. You have the area circled in yellow is a cold front that's moving across portions of Ontario and into uh, southwestern Quebec areas where the snow squall parameter is strongly positive along the boundary, and this is for a forecast uh, valid at 3Z on the 17th. You see here a uh, sharp composite reflectivity, uh, area of intense snow squall activity along the sharp cold front, it affects snow showers further south, extending eastward from Lake Huron in the Georgia Bay area. data for this case, too, just to show the surface isalabars. You actually have 10 millibar rises over three hours just in the wake of the front and a very strong isalabar gradient. That's coincident again with where this favorable combination of instability, temper, RH, and wind speed right along the front. Isalabaric wind would, of course, point from the rises towards the falls, and so you have this strong area of convergence in that area. And so it's highlighting for the forest without looking at any other information uh, the it's uh, favorable for snow squalls. And so this is a useful thing, at least for a situational awareness tool, to get the faster to continue to uh, examine it further and take whatever action may be necessary. Here are the observations. You see quarter to eighth mile in some cases um, associated with a you know, very long uh, 5 to 40 dBZ, in some cases, uh, reflectivity associated with the frontal passage and the associated snow squalls across southwestern Quebec area. The front into northern New York the next morning. This is 12 hour forecast valid at 12 Z of the snow squall parameter with the surface isobars as well. And mosaic reflectivity at this time, you can see bands of uh, snow showers and small area squalls as it came across at about the same time. So it did quite well in this case. We 
view from Burlington, Vermont of the snow squall actually crossing Lake Champlain with what is a leading edge gust front as we would expect with a mesoscale convective system. And just to show briefly is across northern lower Michigan, this is a kilometer wharf, uh, the 18Z run valid at 3Z and have strongly positive values across lower Michigan. Again, Going into all the meteorological details, in addition to the surface low shown here, we had a vigorous upper trough moving in from the west. Uh, it was helping to force the ascent. In our, uh, very strong bands of precipitation moving through northern lower Michigan, uh, roughly 2Z. Uh, observations from Gaylord, uh, visibilities were down to a quarter mile. There was actually some lightning report in the area as well. Um, so this was what we would consider, you know, pretty successful nine-hour forecast using the squall parameter to forecast uh, the actual currents uh, that evening um, on the. The snow can be viewed in real time from the Burlington National Weather Service website at the URLs listed here. The bottom left tab uh, that's available when the menu comes up for the wharf model, both at 4 and 12 kilometers and just click on snow squall parameter and you'll be able to see the actual field. Also, we're going to try to get this included at the Storm Prediction Center um, on the analysis and TREF pins and that makes something available for the next uh, cool season. On how this fits into National Weather Service products. range from simply being a nuisance to being a serious transportation hazard as we've seen. There's PF and in the United States there's no formal warning product because there isn't Canada. So it can be somewhat difficult to get the message out about what it can take. First of all, maintain good situational awareness by being aware of the higher traffic volumes, weekday rush hours, and the weekend routes to and from ski and watching for fall temperatures um, behind the squalls that can often create the uh, icy road conditions that we're, that we're worried about. With special weather statements, these are trackable features in which in AWIPS we can utilize warn gen to create CAF and other, uh, other information um, given that they are forward propagating uh, features increasing and it can be helpful to give a heads up message using Facebook and Twitter that squalls are going to be a concern. Uh, it can be done, you know, in a window of just uh, an hour or two or up to six to 12 hours in some cases if you're thinking about in the morning perhaps an evening commute time frame or something of that nature. When all your, your Department of Transportation, State Police or Airport Control Towers and again the, the, the whole here would be to get them to pre-treat surfaces. Those lines, it's important to establish those sort of partnerships during the off season so that when you deal with these types of situations, ships are in place, the lines of communication are open, and uh, hopefully they take the sort of actions needed to mitigate the accidents and pileups that we can sometimes get on the uh, states across the northern part of the United States. So that's the talk today, and I appreciate everybody's attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pete. You're welcome.